Today we begin the second part of our course in the philosophy of religion. This part of the course focuses on metaphysical issues and the primary metaphysical issues that we are going to focus on have to do with the nature of God and the relationship among various characteristics one might give regarding the nature of God. So let's talk briefly about different approaches one might take to understanding what God is like or to reason about what a deity would appropriately be like. The reason for doing this is because if you're driven by considerations about the meaning or use of the term God or gods, you find all sorts of variants that wouldn't be relevant or interesting for discussions. So, for example, some people claim Michael Jordan is a god. Um, various other attributions of deity, Caesars, typically claimed to be gods. <clears throat> Even in ancient Greece, during the rise of Western philosophy, Socrates was put to get death in part on the charge of atheism. Socrates was not an atheist. He was a monotheist, and he thought it embarrassing to read and hear about the stories concerning the behavior of the gods in the Greek pantheon. So he had an exalted conception of God, and he thought to treat God or the gods in the way the myths about the Greek pantheon did debased God because it turned the gods into something who were petty and small in the way human beings can be, or perhaps tend to be. Among philosophers, at least over the past hundred years or so, the dominant strategy has been Anselmian. The way this strategy gets off the ground is by starting thinking about God in terms of the most perfect being. So we can call this perfect being theology. The hope of perfect being theology is to develop a conception of God that will generate and support an ontological argument, but perfect being theology can be divorced from that. So you might think God is the most, to be a God, you have to be the most perfect possible being. And you might also think, but that doesn't give you an ontological argument. The two don't stand or fall together. Anselmianism, perfect being theology, however, is not the only possible approach to the nature of God. And pretty clearly, it's not the most common approach to the nature of God. I think the approach that holds that title is something you can glean from the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, which says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The primary, I think the most natural approach to the nature of God is to begin from the idea that God is the creator and sustainer of the universe. Call that creator theology. Are there other approaches other than perfect being theology and creator theology? Yes, there's one that I, we're going to spend some time talking about that's different than those first two. But the third one that I think deserves mention up front is to think about God as a being worthy of worship. So whatever worship is, to be a deity is to be worthy of that sort of response. Now that puts ethical demands on the nature of deity, because this isn't just a practical requirement that it would be useful to worship something if it's a god. That would be a self-interested reason for worship. 
The idea of worthiness of worship theology, however, goes beyond that. It doesn't say it's near, it's merely a matter of practical importance that you worship such a being because such a being has immense power over you. That's not the motivation. That's not the justification for worship. The justification for worship is that such a being deserves it. Let's go back to the first one and think about some of the issues that come up when you start thinking about God in terms of being the most perfect possible being. As soon as you start thinking about that, go back to the ontological argument that we talked about. One of the first steps was to say, well, if God's maximum great, he's going to have to have excellences of various sorts, properties that it's better to have than to lack. And among those properties, you quickly get a list of omni properties. You get omniscience, omnipotence, omnibenevolence, omnipresence. You get lots of these sorts of things. Okay, so just begin with the omni properties. You might think that there are problems that come up here. Perhaps some of these omni properties are incompatible with other omni properties or other properties one might care to attribute to God. So, for example, some people think omniscience and eternity are incompatible because to be omniscient, you have to know everything true, and part of knowing what is true is to know what day it is, to know what time it is now. But if you're not in time, how are you supposed to know what time it is now? We'll look at that issue later on. Think about omnipresence. How can you be present everywhere if you don't have a body? That's an interesting question, deserving of some sort of account of how the spirituality of God that many people, many theists attribute to God is compatible with omnipresence. In addition, one of the standard longest standing worries is about the compatibility of omniscience and human freedom. That's usually referred to as the freedom foreknowledge problem. We'll look at that as well. Finally, some of these omni properties have paradoxes associated with them. So omnipotence has a standard paradox, the paradox of the stone. We've already looked at one further difference difficulty for omnibenevolence that arises because of the problem of evil. If God's perfectly good, how can there be bad things that happen? So we will look at all of these features. We're also going to look at a couple of other topics, but we will begin the metaphysical part by taking a look at the nature of God and testing out the prospects for perfect being theology. In the process, we will also compare what you get if you don't go the perfect being theology route, but instead think of God fundamentally in terms of being the creator and sustainer of all, or being the being, being a being or being the being most deserving of the deepest worship.